Hello and welcome to Once Upon a Time. This is one of our favorite shows to be able to read stories and share with you some of the things that we've discovered at the library. I'm Catherine Poulter and, and I'm Becca Hyde. And yes, we are so happy to get to share some lovely books with you. Yes, so I found a book that is about imagination. And I like this because when I was growing up, in our house, we had a staircase that went from the second floor down to the first floor, and it turned and turned and turned. Mm -hmm. And there's one of those in this book, too. In this story, the girl imagines that the stairs are a waterfall. And I never imagined that, but I always remembered, rem I always imagined that it was a slippery slide. So here mm -hmm. we go, the magic house. The story is by Robin Harbert Eversole, and the paintings are by Peter Palagonia. Here we go. The Magic House. The house at 519 Kipperney Street belonged to April. Her mother and her father and her older sister Meredith lived there too, but the house was April's. And the house was magic. In the middle of the house was a waterfall. It ran from the second floor to the first. April could slide down it and never get wet. On the first floor was a desert. The ground was yellow and everywhere there were big cactuses. And April could climb on the cactuses and they would never prickle her. Down in the basement was a cave. Two monsters lived there, way back in the corner. They muttered and growled when April's mother fed them baskets of clothes. Mm -hmm. The monsters weren't very scary, but they were monsters nonetheless. And April was proud to have them in her magic house. The only trouble with the house at 519 Kipperney Street was April's older sister, Meredith. Meredith didn't believe the house was magic and when she walked by the waterfall stopped being a waterfall. Don't slide down the stairs, Meredith would say. When April was in the desert and Meredith came along, the desert became a living room. Stop climbing on the furniture, Meredith would say, as she sat down to practice the piano loudly. Mm -hmm. When you're older, you'll do lots of things, Meredith told April one day. You'll learn piano and ballet like me. Meredith held onto the kitchen counter and lifted one leg in the air. April lifted one leg in the air without holding on to the counter. I do lots of things already, she said. I'm going to be an, a swan in the recital, said Meredith. Will you get to dance in the water, April asked. Not real water, no, Mer Meredith said. She was having trouble with one of her steps and frowned at April. We're supposed to pretend. Meredith did a leap in the middle of the kitchen and the pots and pans in the cupboard shook. Swans don't thump, she said, and she frowned again. But April knew something Meredith didn't. April knew that for weeks and weeks the water had been tumbling down the waterfall and making a beautiful blue lake at the bottom. I don't feel like a swan, Meredith said. I don't look like a swan. I'm a dancer thumping in the middle of the kitchen. The pots and pans shook again. Come with me, April said. April took Meredith to the front hall, right to the edge of the beautiful blue lake. This is a lake, she told Meredith. A beautiful blue lake with reeds all around and swans in the middle. Oh, April, Meredith said, don't act dumb. This is the front hall. 
April sat down on the stairs, which were just stairs and not a waterfall. Practice here anyway, she said. Meredith did a few more leaps, thumping a little less with each one, sailing and soaring more and more like a swan. April felt water running past her hands. It lapped across the floor, reflecting Meredith. Reeds sprouted along the walls, and when Meredith lifted her arms at her sides, April saw wings. Do you see the lake? April asked Meredith. Do you see it? Meredith didn't say anything. She was gliding over the water, and the next moment she wasn't Meredith at all, but a white swan on the beautiful blue lake in the middle of April's magic house. Do you see the lake? April asked again, and she knew, no matter what Meredith said later, that the answer at that moment was Yes. The end. Very magical. <laughs> Very beautiful. I like that. And I want to read a book about mothers. Very nice. And families because it's almost Mother's Day and our mothers love us mm -hmm. all the time, no matter what. And this book won the New York Times Best Illustrated Book for Youth in the year 2002. The First Thing My Mama Told Me by Susan Marie Swanson, illustrated by Christine Davenier. For my mother and father with love. When I was born, the first thing my mama told me was my name. Mama says she told everyone who I was and she wrote my name everywhere. She wrote my name in my mother goose book. She wrote it on the back of pictures, like the picture of me sleeping crooked in my car seat and the one of me chewing my pom-pom cap. Mama says my name comes from a long ago word for light. When I was born, she, left that, she let that name shine on me. When I was one, my grandpa spread frosting on the birthday cupcakes. Then he squeezed yellow letters out of a tube. He kept squeezing until my whole name appeared. Mama took a picture of me, smushing my chocolate <laughs> cupcake and my yellow name. Grandpa says, when I picked that cupcake up, it looked like a rocket taking off. My name was the fire swooshing out. When I was two, Uncle David made a step stool for me. He cut wood with his electric saw, nailed the pieces together, and sanded the edges smooth. He painted my name on top, then painted chipmunks running around my name. He painted trees so the chipmunks and my name would have some shade. <laughs> When I got thirsty, I stood on my name to get a cup of water all by myself. When I was three, I scribbled my name everywhere. I rubbed my name with my finger on the steamy window. I zigzagged my name with chalk on the front steps. I colored it on my hand with a green marker. I squiggled it on the floor with an orange crayon. I splashed my name on the table with red paint. I thought everything belonged to me. My scribbling said so. When I was four, my dad made alphabet pancakes. He flipped my name onto my plate, one letter at a time. I ate the L with maple syrup. I ate the U with jam. I ate the C with apple butter. I ate the Y all by itself. My name tasted wonderful. <laughs> also, when I was four, I got a baby sister named Madeline. She could not eat her big long name, so I helped. When I was five, I found my name on a coat hook at kindergarten. I hung up my sweater right under my name. One day, I lost my sweater on the playground. I looked under the slide and by the swings, and I couldn't find it anywhere. The next day, I looked in the lost and found. In the jumble of mittens and jackets and caps, there were two crumpled sweaters just the same, but one had my name in Mama's tiny writing on the bat on the tag i hung my sweater back up on its own place under my name where it belonged when i was six i stomped my name in the snow 
The snow was my paper. The letters I made were bigger than me. My name was part of the hill, big enough for the sun and moon to read. After supper, I wrote a letter to Uncle David to tell him about the snow paper and my giant name. I told him how I would not let Madeline write over my name with her boots. <laughs> I signed, signed my name at the end of the letter. Madeline signed hers too. Today, I am seven. When Dad lit the candles on my birthday cake, Madeline said they looked like stars. We ate our cake in the backyard under the stars in the sky. Then I opened birthday presents. I got a poster of the planets that Grandpa sent and a puzzle Madeline helped pick out. Uncle David sent a book with empty pages and a packet of pencils with one word stamped on them. Lucy, my golden name. After Dad and Madeline went inside to wrap up the leftover cake, Mama told me to hold out my hands and close my eyes. Her surprise for me was a flashlight of my very own. I clicked it on. I swirled that new flashlight to write my name on the dark. The letters lit up bricks and grass and path and swing and willow leaves whispering in the breeze. Lucy. Then my name went flying out into the big starlit night. The end. Oh, what a nice book <laughs> about a nice name. It is a lovely name. And I have one about a nice piece of music. This book is called Rondo in C. It's by Paul Fleischman and illustrated by Janet Wentworth. And oh, this is beautiful. So if you go and find the musical piece called Rondo in C by Beethoven, you can see what that music suggests to your mind. Here are some of the things that these people think it reminds them of. Here we go, Rondo in C. Beethoven's Rondo in C. Lovely piece. Strange how it brings to mind South Flying Geese. Evenings in Mama's old house on West 12th. Running downhill you kill you till you can't stop yourself. First squint of sunlight on the water in Maine. Lightning bolts thunder, rain pounding the plains. Watching Ray's train leave the station last fall. Life back in Vienna, the concerts, the balls. Falling snow swirling around the street light. Holding kite close in the garden that night. Galloping bareback at dusk on Banshee. Playing this very same piece <clears throat> for Miss Lee. Bravo, young lady, for that rondo in C. The end. Such fancy illustrations. So, so beautiful. beautiful, yes. <laughs> Here's a brand new book that came, and it tells the story of John Deere, who was a blacksmith who didn't invent the tractor at all, but it made it better. Yeah, started a chain of good events. <laughs> mm -hmm. The name is. John Deere, that's who, by Tracy Nelson Moore, and illustrated by Tim Zeltner. Back in John Deere's day, long before tractors and other newfangled contraptions, Americans dug the land with the same kind of plow that farmers had used as long as anyone could remember. That plow in the 1830s was surely less than perfect, but it worked. So who would want to change it? John Deere, that's who.
But John didn't set out to build a new plow right away. He was just another young blacksmith from Vermont, a hard-working one, mind you. His fine skills earned him buckets of praise. Still, times were tough and folks sometimes failed to pay him. John's business struggled. Then disaster struck. His forge burned to the ground. Of course John rebuilt it and then another fire. Soon he was out of cash and out of luck. John needed a fresh start, so with a few of his best iron-working tools, he joined the steam of pioneers and the stream headed west in the 1836 time. He planted and planned to send for his wife and children when he was settled. Luck started to shine on him when he arrived in Grand Detour. Grand Detour, Illinois. The little town needed a blacksmith to fix broken pots and pans, horseshoes and pitchforks and shovels and plows, and lots and lots of plows. John quickly built a forge. Smoke poured from the slow fire that burned from sunrise to sunset, and sometimes longer than that. Clang, clang, clang. That man was a a workhorse hammering red-hot iron to repair tools so they were as good as new, even better than new. John also fixed the farmer's heavy iron plows again and again. Stubborn twisted roots deep under the prairie banged up the iron blades. Even worse, the thick rich soil the farmers called gumbo in a not so nice way. <laughs> stuck to their plows like gummy black snowballs. Farmers had to stop every so often to scrape the gumbo off with a paddle. That made a day's work take a lot longer. John heard the farmers complain again and again. I reckon I'm cleaning that plow pret near every few steps. It's a gonna take me forever a day and a day to plow my claim. Ufta, this heavy plow wrenches the dickens out of my back. <laughs> They were tuckered out. Some farmers talked about hightailing it back to the east where the soil was sandy and easy to till. John didn't want to lose his customers. Truth be told, he missed his family and he had a debt to pay. That's when John set his mind to building a better plow. He tried new plow angles. He studied how the gumbo clung to the tiny pits in the iron. It's a fair guess that John already knew of other plow designs that called for lightweight steel rather than heavy iron, but steel was rare that far west and too pricey. But then one day at the sawmill in 1837, John found a broken steel saw blade that he could take back to his smithy. There John chiseled off the saw's teeth and, on the and cut the steel into the shape of a plow's blade. He curved it over a log so it would shrug off soil. Then he polished the steel as shiny as his mother's sewing needles. Those needles could slip through calico like a hot knife through butter. Maybe a shiny plow would slice through gumbo. The town's families gathered at a local farmer's field to watch John test his gleaming self-polisher. They didn't expect much. But who amazed them all? John Deere, that's who. Stories of the day claimed he dug 12 rows, neat as you please. Many farmers were still leery. John built several plows for farmers to try in their own fields. Test after test, John's smooth steel plow cut so quickly and easily, it truly hummed down the rows. In time, customers began asking for Mr. Deer's singing plow. You can bet John was happy to send for his family in 1838 and mighty relieved to settle his debt five years later. In another five years, the entire Deer family moved to Moline, Illinois. John wanted his company closer to the Mississippi River for better water power and easier deliveries. All the while, John kept tinkering with the plow design to keep his customers happy. 
Under his leadership, John's company sold tens of thousands of singing plows and other horse-drawn equipment. Farmers plowed the prairie soil faster than ever. They planted more than enough food for their families, selling the extra crops. Farming grew into a business, and the prairie fields of grain became known as America's bread basket. So who changed the plow for America's farmer? Who changed the nation forever? John Deere, that's who. The end. What a good story. I want a singing plow. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I will sing as I plow or as I dig. This next story is funny. It's called Horrible Bear. It's written by Amy Dykeman and illustrated by Zachariah O'Hara. Horrible Bear. Rrr. Here we go. Look, the little girl is playing with a kite and the string breaks, snap! And there is the kite, right up by the bear's cave. A girl peeked into bear's cave. Look, there's the kite on the floor. She reached, but he rolled. <gasps> Crunch! Horrible bear, the girl shouted. The girl stomped down the mountain. Horrible bear. She stomped through the meadow. Horrible bear. She stomped all the way home. Horrible bear. Bear was indignant. I'm not horrible, he said. She barged in. She made a ruckus. She woke me up. How would she like it if... <gasps> Bear got an idea. It was a horrible bear idea. <laughs> bear practiced barging. He practiced making a ruckus. He practiced waking somebody up. Horrible bear, Bat squeaked. Perfect, Bear said. Bear stomped out of his cave. The girl stomped into her room, but she was too upset to nap. So the girl tried drawing, horrible bear. She tried reading, horrible bear. She tried talking to the best listener she knew. That horrible bear, he broke my <gasps> rip. Suddenly, her stuffy couldn't listen as well as before. Oh no, I didn't mean to, the girl cried. <gasps> oh! <laughs> Meanwhile, Bear stomped down the mountain. Rawr, rawr, rawr. He stomped through the meadow. Rawr, rawr, rawr. He stomped straight to the girl's front door. Rawr. Which opened? I'm sorry, the girl said, and all the horrible went right out of Bear. Bear patted. He wiped. Look, he's, look, he's using a sock to wipe her tears. <laughs> he got another idea. It was a sweet Bear idea. Thank you, Bear, the girl whispered. She had a sweet Bear idea, too. Bear and the girl skipped through the meadow. They bounced up the mountainside. And together, they patched everything up, even the kite. Nothing was horrible at all. For the moment, the end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. And now I will read to you about a daring young astronaut who knows that there will be life on Mars and he in, he's prepared with mm -hmm. chocolate cupcakes for that great adventure. Life on Mars by John Agee. The rocket is coming <laughs> and there it is on Mars. 
I am on Mars. I have traveled a long way from Earth. I am here to find life. Everybody thinks I'm crazy. Nobody believes there's life on Mars, but I do. And I just know that I am going to find it. Quack, 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 quack. Oh. Who is that? <laughs> so far, Mars looks pretty gloomy. More gloomy than I thought. I am starting to wonder, could anything possibly live here? It's dark. It's cold. I've brought this gift of cho chocolate cupcakes. I don't think I'll find anybody to eat them. Wow, I was wrong. Mars, Mars is nothing but miles and miles of rocks and dirt. It's obvious. Nothing could possibly live here. What a disaster. Everybody was right. There is no life on Mars. I am going home immediately. Hmm. A little box. Uh-oh. Where is my spaceship? <laughs> I can't believe it. I'm lost. Lost on Mars, where there is no life. Wait a minute. What's that? No way. It's life. It's on Mars, and it's alive. <laughs> <laughs> what an amazing discovery. I can't wait to get back to Earth and show everybody what I found. And look, my box of cupcakes. How did it get there? Now I've got to find my spaceship. I'll bet I'll get a good view from the top of that mountain. <laughs> Aha! There it is! What an adventure! I always believed there was life on Mars. And I was right. <laughs> I think I deserve a treat. What? Crumbs? <laughs> <laughs> Chocolate crumbs. <laughs> oh, very good. Life, Life on Mars. On Mars. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have another one. This one is called The Goblin and the mm. Empty Chair. And this is such a nice book. It's by Mem Fox and illustrated by Leo and Diane Dillon. The Goblin and the Empty Chair. In a time long past, in a land far away, there lived a goblin who had once seen himself reflected in a pond. His reflection had frightened him so much, he decided to hide his face from the world forever, so as not to frighten anyone else. He kept himself to himself, took care not to be seen, and spent many years alone. But one day, the goblin happened to see a farmer sigh set down his tools and bury his head in his hands. That night, the goblin went to work. He dug where digging was needed. He chopped where chopping was needed. He painted where painting was needed and was careful not to be seen. But in spite of his care, the goblin was seen. The farmer, unable to sleep, stared out into the dark and watched without a word. The following day on the very same farm, the goblin saw a woman 
sigh, set down her pail and bury her head in her hands. That night, the goblin went to work. He watered where watering was needed. He planted where planting was needed. He pruned where pruning was needed and was careful not to be seen. But in spite of his care, the goblin was seen. The woman, unable to sleep, stared out into the dark and watched without a word. The following day on the very same farm, the goblin saw a child sigh, set down her book and bury her head in her hands. That night, the goblin went to work. He sat where sitting was needed. He soothed where soothing was needed. He stayed where staying was needed and was careful not to be seen. But in spite of his care, the goblin was seen. The child woke, kept very still, and watched without a word. In the morning, the child, the woman, and the farmer sat silent at their table, staring at the chair that had been empty all winter. Finally, the woman sat a place in front of the empty chair. The farmer filled a plate with food. The child opened the door and they waited. The goblin waited too and longed to join them, but he dared not show his face lest it should frighten them away. So he stayed where he was. At last the farmer sighed and rose from the table without a word. The woman followed and the child made to follow as well. Wait, said the goblin, wait. So the farmer and the woman and the child sat down again and the goblin came and sat in the empty chair. They looked at one another and smiled and they began to eat. The end. Wonderful story. I like that one too. I like that a lot. I brought a book that's, um, it's a little bit rough on the edges, but it's a wonderful book from the past written by Mary Rayner, and it's called Mr. and Mrs. Pig's Evening Out. And it's a book that I read to my family, my children, when they were little, many, many, many times. It was a favorite. <laughs> oh, very nice. <laughs> because mothers, even pig mothers, need a night out. And, <laughs> <laughs> and here we go. Once upon a time, there lived a family of pigs. There was father pig and mother pig. And there were 10 piglets. They were called Sorrel Pig, Briony Pig, Hillary Pig, Sarah Pig, Cindy Pig, Toby Pig, Alum Pig, William Pig, Garth Pig, and Benjamin Pig. <laughs> One evening, Mother Pig called the children to her as they were playing all over the house. Now, piglets, she said, your father and I are going out this evening. There was a chorus of groans. Not far, said Mrs. Pig and I've asked a very nice lady to come and look after you. What's her name? asked William Pig. I don't like babysitters, said Benjamin. Oh, said Mrs. Pig, looking vague. Well, she's coming from the agency, so I'm not sure what her name is, but you're sure to like her. We didn't like the last one from the agency, grumbled Garth. I'm sure you'll find that this babysitter will be very nice. Now get along into your baths and I'll come and tuck you up before we go out. The piglets took as long as they possibly could, having their baths and made a great many puddles and splashes in the bathroom. But at last, Mother Pig got them upstairs. Just as she was putting on her best dress, the front doorbell rang. Down ran Mrs. Pig grunting and puffing in her haste to open the door. 
A dark face peered at her heavily wrapped in a Macintosh and hat. Are you Mrs. Pig? asked a, gr a gruff voice. Yes, said Mother Pig brightly. Do come in. The children are just getting into their beds. They sleep in bu bunk beds, she explained, and so they did. Two to a bed, head to tail, stacked five beds high. <laughs> <laughs> Can you help me? called Father Pig from the bedroom. Mrs. Pig hurried upstairs. He was just putting on his smart shirt, which he always wore when they went out. It was a dark blue shirt, and Mrs. Pig liked him to wear it because she thought it made him look thinner. Unfortunately, <laughs> it made him, unfortunately, the buttons would keep coming undone so that everyone always noticed how very tight the shirt had become. <laughs> Mrs. Pig struggled to get it done up. Suddenly, she remembered that she had not asked the babysitter's name. She ran out of the bedroom again. The babysitter was just settling herself comfortably on the sofa. Would you mind telling me what you are called, said Mrs. Pig. The children do like to know. It's Mrs. Wolf, said the babysitter, crossing a pair of thick, hairy legs and getting out her knitting. Oh, thank you, said Mrs. Pig without thinking. Now, Mrs. Wolf, I've left the kitchen light on, and if you should feel like making yourself a hot drink or having something to eat later in the evening, do please help yourself. Thank you. I shall, said Mrs. Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> After that, Mrs. Pig called through to say that they were quite ready, and with many farewell kisses and hugs for the children, Mr. and Mrs. Pig went out for the evening with light hearts. Mrs. Wolf sat in the living room and read magazines and knitted. The piglets all seemed to have gone off to sleep. She went upstairs once to check. It seemed a very long evening. There was nothing to watch on the television. After a while, Mrs. Wolf began to feel empty, so she went into the kitchen but she didn't turn on the kettle. No, she turned on the oven. Then she tiptoed up to the piglet's bedroom. In the lower bunk bed were Garth and Benjamin snoring faintly. Mrs. Wolf looked longingly at Garth, all rosy, plump, and pink. Then she snatched him up and carried him off downstairs. He made such a snorting and a squealing that all his brothers and sisters sat bolt upright in bed. Whatever was going on? Quick as a flash, Sorrel cried, After him, everyone! Mrs. Wolf is not to be trusted! Seizing Garth's blanket off his bed, the nine piglets galloped downstairs as fast as their short legs would carry them. They were in the nick of time. Mrs. Wolf was bending over the oven with her back to them, holding Garth about to put him in. Four of you take this side of the blanket for that, hissed Sorrel outside the kitchen. The piglets did as they were told. Now, ordered Sorrel, they ran in and threw the blanket over Mrs. Wolf's head. She backed away from the oven, still holding Garth. Muffled snarls came through the blanket. The piglets held on tight. Mrs. Wolf struggled and threshed, but she could not get out. She dropped Garth and went down on all fours. Garth wriggled free and the piglets hung on. Mrs. Wolf braced herself and humped her back. Her long hairy tail lashed from side to side. Terrible growls came from her. Hang on everyone, shouted Sorrel. Shouted Sorrel. Mrs. Wolf leapt into the air. The piglets were tossed to and fro, but still they hung on bravely. As soon as they were back on their feet, they circled round and round her so that the blanket was wrapped tighter and tighter. Then they tied the four corners together so she could not possibly get out and left her in the middle of the kitchen. When their father and mother came home, the ten piglets told them what a narrow escape they had had. Father Pig went out into the night and carried the blanket bundle to the middle of the bridge. There he leant over the parapet and shook Mrs. Wolf off into the swirling depths of the big river. And she was not heard of again for a very long time.
time. Whew. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, I'm glad they escaped. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> All right, the next book I have is one, I think you'll like it. It's a really sweet one, and it's called A Baker's Portrait. It's by Michelle Edwards. A Baker's Portrait. In the town of Hochel, after the leaves had fallen from the trees and the farmers had prepared for a long winter's rest, a portrait painter named Mihaline sat in her studio and sulked. There hadn't been much business for Mihaline since she'd painted the mayor of Alga and his family. Mihaline always painted just what she saw. And when she saw the fat mayor, his warty wife, and their cross-eyed children, she looked very carefully at them and then painted just what she saw. So what would be so terrible if you didn't paint every wart on her face, <laughs> Grandma Levy asked her one day. Couldn't you give someone a little enjoyment? Make someone happy. Make someone beautiful. Think about what she says, said Mama, because a little business has come your way. Your beloved Aunt Lillian and Uncle Ferdinand want you to paint their portraits. Mihaline's stomach ached. Ferdinand and Lillian were bakers. They were so fat they broke chairs. When Beauty had knocked on their door, they must have been kneading bread. <laughs> Tomorrow you start, Grandma Levy told her, and you will stay with Ferdinand and Lillian until the portraits are finished. The next afternoon, Ferdinand and Lillian greeted Michelin at the back door. They were even fatter than she had remembered. So, my lovely niece, how and when do we begin? asked Aunt Lillian with a big smile. Michelin had forgotten that all of her bottom teeth were missing. No, no. First, I need some time to think, Michelin told them. Mihaline went upstairs in the big room Ferdinand and Lillian had given to her. She set up her easel and her paints, but all she could think about were Ferdinand's big belly and Lillian's missing teeth. Mihaline imagined her aunt and uncle as king and queen of their bakery in beautiful white aprons and crowning white baker's hats, but when she drew their faces, they turned out just like Ferdinand and Lillian, <laughs> ordinary bakers fat and ugly. Perhaps tomorrow will be better, said Mihaline before she went to sleep. The next morning and every morning after, Mihaline drew. After a few weeks, she had piles and piles of drawings, drawings of Ferdinand with hair he hadn't had for years, drawings of Ferdinand without any hair at all, drawings of Lillian with a mouthful of teeth, <laughs> drawings of Lily of, of her without top teeth or bottom <laughs> teeth. Drawings that were terrible, drawings that would make Ferdinand and Lillian scream, not to mention what Grandma Levy would say. This is harder than painting that mayor and his warty cross-eyed family, Mihaline groaned. What was she going to do? How are the portraits? Uncle Ferdinand asked every evening after dinner. They're coming along, she always answered. Later in her room, she would gaze at the stars and wonder if she would ever finish their portraits. Then one evening, Uncle Ferdinand knocked on her door. I thought you might like another piece of chocolate cake, he said as he plopped down in a big old chair. You know, Mihaline, when I look at that cake, I think of my lily. Sweet on the outside and rich on the inside. Sometimes we joke, Lily and me. I tell her she's my chocolate cake. 
she tells me I'm her holla, a little crusty on the outside, but soft on the inside. And you know, me Helene, Uncle Ferdinand whispered, no matter how old the holla, it's always tastes as good as the day it was baked. After Uncle Ferdinand left the room, me Helene stared at the cake for a long time. Then she took a canvas from the corner and put it on her easel and began to paint. She painted all night long. The next morning, Mihaline flew down the stairs and into the kitchen. Your portraits are done, she shouted. Ferdinand and Lillian rushed into town to tell everyone that the moment had finally arrived. Soon friends and relatives began pouring into their house. Uncle Lev, the barber, and his wife, Sonia, and their six children came. Cousin Sarah, the butcher and her husband, Lazar came, Rabbi Ralphie and his wife, his wife Hannah, and their new baby Isaac came. And finally, Mama came with Grandma Levy. How much longer must an old lady wait, growled Grandma Levy. Bring down your masterpiece. Mihaline ran to her room, threw a sheet over her painting, carried it downstairs, and set it up in the middle of the room. Suddenly, everyone was quiet. Rabbi Rafi said a prayer. Ferdinand and Lillian closed their eyes and held hands with Mihaline's portraits. One never knew. <laughs> then, holding her breath, Mihaline lifted the sheet. Really, my chocolate cake, cried Uncle Ferdinand. It is really us. He gave Aunt Lillian a big kiss. Aunt Lillian began to cry. Oh, Ferdy, you crush, you crusty old holla. Isn't it wonderful? Everyone crowded around the painting. What did I tell you, Lily? exclaimed Mama. My daughter is another Da Vinci. Oh. From you, I never expected such a thing, barked Grandma Levy. Other things, maybe, but not this. She patted me Helene's arm. No, now you are ready. Now I shall let you paint my paint my picture. <laughs> me Helene looked into the pale blue eyes of Grandma Levy. She thought of the coldness in her in her wrinkled hand. She thought of the wind in her loud voice. She thought of the softness of her white hair. She thought of the gentleness of her touch. For the first time in her life, Mihaline realized that Grandma Levy was like the first snow of winter. And look, mm -hmm. there's the portrait of Grandma Levy. The end. Delightful. What a Absolute sweet story. <laughs> I want to read a classic picture book by David Small from the year 1985. This is Imogene's Antlers. On Thursday, when Imogene woke up, she found she had grown antlers. <laughs> Getting dressed was difficult, and going through a door now took some thinking. Imogene started down for breakfast. But got hung up. Oh! Imogene's mother fainted away. <laughs> the doctor poked and prodded and scratched his chin. He could find nothing wrong. The school principal glared at Imogene, but had no advice to offer. Her brother Norman consulted the encyclopedia and then announced that Imogene had turned into a rare form of miniature elf, elk. 
Imogene's mother fainted again and was carried upstairs to bed. Imogene went into the kitchen. Lucy, the kitchen maid, had her sit by the oven to dry some towels. Lovely antler, said Lucy. The cook, Mrs. Perkins, gave Imogene a donut, then decked her out with several more and sent her into the garden to feed the birds. <laughs> You'll be lots of fun to decorate come Christmas, said Mrs. Perkins. Later, Imogene wandered upstairs. She found the whole family in Mother's bedroom. Donuts, anyone? she asked. Her mother said, Imogene, we have decided there is only one thing to do. We must hide your antlers under a hat. <laughs> Norman telephoned the milliner. At three o'clock, the milliner arrived. Rapidly, he sketched a few designs, then set to work. Voila, said the milliner. Bravo, bravissimo, cried his assistants. Thud. Imogene's mother had to be carried away once more. <laughs> After dinner, Imogene practiced her piano lesson. <laughs> Lovely candles. Then yawning, she folded her music, kissed the family, and went to bed. Imogene sighed, remembering the long, eventful day. On Friday, when Imogene awoke, the antlers had disappeared. When she came down to breakfast, the family was overjoyed to see her back to normal. Until she came into the room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. Lovely classic story. That is. Here's one called Sail Away Home mm. by Bruce Deacon. Thank you, Becca. <laughs> Poor Sam. Sail away, sail away over the foam. Blow with the gale away, bear with a pail away. Hitch to a whale and then Sail away home. Right away, right away, where will you roam? Where pirates hide away, with treasure to pry away. Skip away, slip away, slide, and then right away home. Fly away, fly away, up in the sky away. Cloud beds to lie away. Rainbow cream pie away. <laughs> Cut me a slice and then fly away home. Skip away, skip away, out on my own. Dragonflies zip away, butterflies sip away. Frogs do a flip and then skip away home. Run away, run away, happy alone. Dreams in the sun away, battles all won away. There's someone to tell if you Run away home. The end. And I think that's the end of our wonderful story time. Do join us again. Come back to the library and visit us and see all of the books we have to share. And then tell us what your favorite ones are. <laughs> we love to see you and long to have you come to the library. So goodbye. Farewell.